Yeah, hi everybody, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. As many of you know, one of my main themes in my theology and theologist's work is religiously empowered evil. And religiously empowered evil enforces itself and undergirds itself through the idea that there's something you need to do or not do to make God or Jehovah or whoever it is happy or stop him from being sad. Now I want to say that again. Religiously empowered evil enforces and undergirds itself by making the person think that there's something they need to do or not to do something to make God happy or Jehovah happy or stop him from being sad. Now there's multitudes of stories throughout all religious denominations and um, cults of religiously empowered evil. Now, be it that I'm very interested in the Jehovah Witnessism um, movement or cult, uh, I found a story that was released yesterday at 3.13pm uh, on the 14th of May. We're on the 16th of May, and I've left it because I wanted to see if I felt to do this or not, but I'm going to share this story. I don't know how many people have seen it or heard it, but it's about the House of Horror, my evil Jehovah Witness foster mum. Uh, and it says, forced a hot poker down my throat, smashed my kneecap with a cricket bat, and made me and my sisters eat our own vomit to stop us sinning. Chris Spy, 30, suffered 13 years of abuse at the hands of a foster mum, Eunice. Now, anybody that has any clue about foster mums or step-parents or anything, it doesn't always go well. That doesn't mean it always goes bad. But many, many times it can be the story of Cinderella and the two sisters and the, you know, horrible step as it were. Well, here's a classic case of a woman that's fostered a child and how she's got through the screening process, I'm not sure, but they still do. Um, she's fostered the child and this has been the result of it. Now, there's a story here and I am going to play it for you. Let's just see what Christopher has to say. I've just chopped the ad out of it and we'll go with the story now. People were starting to notice bruises. People were starting to notice cuts. And overnight she changed her, her abuse strategy. So it was a lot more beatings in places which couldn't be seen. To cover her tracks, Eunice took all the children out of school and moved them to the country. After we moved into... So she's isolated these children now. This is how religiously empowered evil works. It's cunning, it's clever, it knows all the strategies, it, it will mull over itself like a chow, cow chewing cud, finding ways that it can meet its inner needs to satisfy its urge for evil. Now this Jehovah Witness woman, I'm going to repeat, Jehovah Witness woman, has gone to the trouble to take these children to an isolated property. She's chosen to dwell where she can have full control over these souls. The farmhouse, um, the abuse ramped up quite a bit. The drownings probably happened weekly. The beatings were daily. Uh, we were starting to be starved at this point as well. This is the farmhouse we moved into. Just above the back door is the room that I got locked in with my sister and we got starved for, God, over a week. I remember eating those bits of newspaper and stuff. We were just eating anything we could find in that room, but it was a stripped down room because it was being uh, reconditioned. So it was just bare floorboards and a light in the corner. One day she did bring some bread up, but when you haven't met for a long time, 
we ate the food and puked it straight up. And she laughed and then told us to eat that. So we ate that. And luckily we held that down or it, it would have just carried on. We were given water on a few of the days, but we probably went three days without water. But a couple of days you start, you start getting hallucinations. And I remember looking at the one corner of the room and it just folding. It was almost wobbling in and out. And it terrified me because I thought it was something spiritual. We've been told, you know, uh, anything magic is the devil's work. You've got no idea what goes on behind closed doors in a lot of these religious homes. When doctors examined 30-year-old Christmas Spry's drawer, they were horrified to find the tip of a steak knife lodged there that his evil foster mother had rammed down his throat when he was a child. One of the many horrific injuries he suffered over a 13-year period at the hands of Eunice Spry, a Jehovah Witness woman, who would shove hot pokers down his throat, lock him away naked and starving for months at a time, and once kneecapped him with a cricket bat. Poor fellow. Gosh. Chris was fostered at the age of three and taken to Tewkesbury. Forgive me if I haven't pronounced that properly. Chris, who featured in Five Stars My Mother the Monster, told Sun Online that Jehovah Witness Eunice kept a variety of poles, sticks and knives on their remote Tewkesbury farmhouse to discipline the little boy and his two foster sisters. She would shove things down our throats, which was the worst for me, he says. A steak knife, chair legs, a machete at one point. She even put a hot poker down there. I can't go to the dentist today without being knocked out because having anything in my mouth is traumatic. There's Eunice, and she's got that Jehovah Witness look, hasn't she? The scowl. Jehovah's Witness look. Um, Eunice Fry pictured after her arrest, subjected Chris to 13 years of abuse. And I want to show this woman's face. Horrible woman. Chris, who was fostered by Spry at three, is still battling with the mental and physical damage caused by her abuse living with a constant pain, walking with a limp, and needing several operations on scars that have turned cancerous. I don't know why Eunice did all this stuff to us, he says. I don't think she was insane. I don't think she was mad. She was just pure evil. Now, what a lot of people don't realize in religion is it's not just a game. It's not just a thing that you go and do and everybody's going to be okay and nobody's going to get harmed or maimed and, um, you know, everything's just going to be all right. Religion, unfortunately, doesn't work that way. And for the normal lay person, um, they don't see a lot of the trauma and damage that comes out of religious homes. And the normal lay person, and I hope many of you are watching this, will not realize what evil religion can incur. And this evil, believe it or not, comes out of trying to keep God's standards, which is so paradoxical. 99.9% .9 of religion tells you there's a standard you need to keep to make Jehovah happy or stop him from being sad. But these narrow-minded, shallow thinking, theological abusive representatives don't realize the full nature of how religion works. Now, many of you know I'm a relative expert on Romans 7, but I just want to point out a couple of factors without going into all of it. I'll start in verse 4. Paul speaking to Jewish believers, not Gentile believers. 
Now, why was he speaking to Jewish believers on this matter? Well, one thing's for sure, viewers, Western people that are not Jews were never, ever under the law. They're not supposed to have anything to do with the law. Christian people have nothing to ever have to deal with the law because we were never under the law. We've got no right to trifle or interfere with the Mosaic law. It was given to the Israeli Jewish people for a specific purpose and they paid a high price trying to keep that thing, which was impossible. And we Western people try and trifle with the principles of the moral standards of the law and religious ceremonies of the law. None of us are anywhere near it. And we should stay away from it. And this is the reason why. Therefore, my brethren, this is messi mess messianic believers. You also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Now, through the body of Christ is speaking about the entire application to the believer that all issues between themselves and God have been dealt with and resolved for time and eternity, never to be worried about again, ever. That you be, may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that you may bear fruit to God. So the only way a person can bear fruit to God is by knowing that there's nothing they can do or not do to there's nothing they can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. There's nothing they can do. And that the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything he appropriated through what he did on the cross and when he was buried and rose again, it's so simple. Settled all issues, all matters between humanity and deity for time and eternity never having to be worried about again. So if you believe in the finished work of Christ and you have faith in that and you receive it by grace, for by grace you have been saved, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, then you will bear fruit to God or to Jehovah. Because the fruit that you bear has nothing to do with what you do. It's got to do with what the Godhead done. And see, if you can't accept the Godhead, then you can't really, you'll never be able to fully figure out everything that happened at the cross. So when we're in the flesh, speaking to Jews, we being the Jews, we're just spectators of this part of this letter because we're never under the law. You see, this idea of trying to make all scripture applicable to all believers, doesn't work. It produces trouble. And you'll find that most of the troubles caused by the Westerners who try and keep the Mosaic Law, because you can't, it's got nothing to do with us, I repeat. The Mosaic Law has got nothing to do with people that are not Jews. And if the Jews, and I say this very, very sensi with sensitivity and carefully, the Jews, if they get it right, wouldn't be under the law either. Very careful when I speak about the Jews because God's got a, a passion for the Jews that is unique and exclusive to them. The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So when you think there's something... Cause there, there is something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, which is the simplest definition of law. The simple de definition of what the Mosaic law requires is this, that there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. So when you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, right, which is 99.9% .9 of religious people, then guess what? You're going to bear fruit to death. Which brings us to Eunice Spry. 
Now, some people have more ability to restrain themselves from their sinful nature than others. And some people come into religion and they end up worse than what they were before they come into it. Some people are better off staying away from it, particularly if they're being taught the wrong things. Eunice Spry is a case, a theological case, of a classic example of what, and there's the victim there, of what religion can do. She, the man said he didn't think she was mad or insane. He just said, I just think she was pure evil. And if she was a Jehovah Witness woman, and she thought, and she would have thought she was pleasing her God, right, her Jehovah God, wasn't she deluded? Now, if we go back to Romans 7, I'll take you a little bit further. I don't want to keep you too long. But now we have been delivered by the law. Now, who's the, from the law? Who's the we? You've got to get this in its context. The Gentiles were never under the law. But now we, the Messianic Jews, the ones that have turned to Christ, have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit. And there's, see, the Bible has no trouble mentioning the Holy Spirit and what he does and how he helps us and how he counsels us, unlike a lot of the Jehovah Witness teaching and not in the oldness of the letter. We were never under the law. Now, I'll take this a little bit further. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. No, it's not. The problem's with us. On the contrary, I would have not known sin except through the law. The more he tried to keep the law, the more he could see that there was something wrong inside him. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, how does, how does sin take opportunity over humanity? By the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It sounds unbelievable. It sounds like something, it sounds like I'm the madman, doesn't it? It sounds like I've got to be mad, but I didn't write the Bible. I wouldn't have put that in there if I had have written the Bible. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. So it wasn't just some manner of evil desire, right? And he's used the word evil, even though it's in italics. The things we thought we needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop, stop him from being sad produced in us all manner of evil desire. Now I want you to stop and think for a minute. I want you to just stop and think for a minute. How many people, include maybe even yourself, I'd say even say yourself, how many people, including yourself, do you think there are that think that there is something they need to do or not do to make Jehovah happy or stop him from being sad? Now stop again and think. If what the Bible's saying is true, What's actually happening inside the mind of that person, including yourself? Pretty serious thought, isn't it? For apart from the law, sin was dead. This is what I mean when I say some people are better off staying right away from evil because of because when there's some nothing when you're in a place where you think there's nothing you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad sin religiously empowered sin that side of sin is dead and what happens is people come into religion you know, they've got these religious evangelists running around thinking they're going to help them. And if they get the thing wrong and the person thinks, which is automatic, he thinks there's something I need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, 
guess what? Sin becomes alive. I was once, I was alive once without the law. See? But when the commandment came, when there was something, as soon as I thought there was something I needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, sin revived and I died. And what he means by that is sin began to influence my thinking. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. So you've got preachers running around and elders running around telling people that there's things they need to do or not do to make God happy and stop him from being sad, thinking that it's bringing life. But it's actually bringing death. You need to stop and think about what I'm teaching here. For sin, taking occasion by what? How does sin take occasion over humanity, over individuals? By the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Now it takes occasion by that and it also deceives us through that. And it deceives us to the point where our normal ability to think with good intention is overridden by deceived thinking. And that's why people start off in religion and it's all going well. And then all of a sudden this wonderful person will pop up in the news and they're as evil as you can get. This wonderful religious person on the outside wasn't so wonderful underneath. And what I'm showing you here, I believe, if I wanted, well, if I wanted to, I could be traveling the world teaching this, but I'd rather be at home with my missus. That's why I don't do it. But what I'm teaching you here is probably one of the most important modern day messages for religion today. Because religion's in a spin. There are good areas of it, and a lot of people are going good with it. But individually underneath, 99.9% 90 .9 of people don't know what I'm talking about. Has then what is good become deaf to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear to be sin, was producing death in me through what is good. Sin was producing death in him through what was good. See, so it all sounds good and looks good and feels good and Aren't I good when I'm doing things I think I need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad? But guess what? All it's doing is producing death. Because you've slipped away from the finished work of Christ and the freedom that you have to not worry about anything to do with making God happy or stop him from being sad. Because your faith's done that. So that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. See, there's no middle ground. If you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you are setting yourself up to be exceedingly sinful. Now, it may not feel that way, it may not seem that way, and all this stuff, and the elder, look, isn't he unreal? But you're in a very dangerous place. I'm sorry, but this is just the way it is. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing... Now, how many people do you think that have found themselves in an evil situation, religious people, right? And might I just say, Ted, Ted Bundy, one of the most infamous and notorious murderers, was brought up in a seven-day Adventist home or, or a Mormon or some kind of religious home. But what a lot of people don't know is his mother had an affair and on his birth certificate, when it was described who was the father, it actually had unknown. So there was a psychology behind Ted Bundy's hate towards women and part of that hatred was birthed out of the fact 
that his mother had slept with a man that she didn't know, and Ted was the result of that moment. How would you feel if you found on your birth certificate the father unknown? Another thing that people don't really realise is Hitler um, was in, an Austrian who was raised apparently in a Jewish community, but he had a Jewish girlfriend when he was young that he fell madly in love with, and she rejected him, and he couldn't salvage the relationship. And that could have been the trigger. The spite and the resentment and the bitterness that come out of being rejected by the woman that he loved at such a young age could have been the trigger that fueled Hitler to try to exterminate the Jewish race. They're little triggers with massive impacts. And here we think, right, we think we can trifle with the law, the Gentiles that were never under the law, and get away with it unscathed. This would have to be one of the most important chapters in the Bible. In fact, I believe that this should be part of every Christian's foundation course, and until you get it, you shouldn't go any further. But nevertheless, Romans 7.14 for we know that the law, the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. So that's bringing us back to the part where the sin has the ability to deceive. Okay? Here, this is the part where the sin has the ability to deceive, where he's gotten to the point where it's killed him in the sense that for what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, and what do religious people hate? They hate evil. But the evil that I hate, that I do. Now, how do we know Paul was doing that? Because he was going around murdering the Christians, wasn't he? He was harming people. He was evil. And this is something that a lot of people don't realise about the nature of God because we've been blind, blindsided by religion to not understand the full personality and nature of God. See, even though God's sovereign, and almighty and omnipotent and all this other stuff. The global rule that protects humanity against evil is that you're not allowed to harm humanity. So Romans 10, 12 or something like that, or somewhere it says in Romans 13, Romans 13, love does no harm to a neighbour, Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. So anything that does harm to humanity, be it God himself or not, has to have an evil part to its nature. And people can't understand the fact, and this is, they just can't understand the fact that God could be evil. Well, did God ever harm people? I'm going to say it again. Has God in the, the God of the Bible ever harm people? Yes, he has. But this is where you've got to understand that Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word become flesh, was God as man. Because ultimately, God said, look, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix this for you. I can't keep doing this. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to punish myself, and that's going to be it. The last time, it's going to pay for everything. It's going to take away, even though you're still going to be bad and have problems, this is going to be enough to say that I'm never going to do that again. But then you've got the issues of Armageddon and everything, haven't we? What? Let me just say, uh, what a lot of people don't realise about Armageddon is it's not God that's going to be killing people it's the nations 
that are going to be protecting and trying to destroy Israel. The sheep nations will be trying to protect it. The goat nations will be trying to destroy it. And at the end, have I got my Clarence Larkin? Yep. And at the end, here, at this point, the Lord himself will descend. And he'll land on the Mount of Olives and he is supernaturally going to destroy all the enemies that are trying to wipe out Israel. Okay? Not all people. God's not going to destroy all people. The end of Armageddon is when the Lord returns to the Mount of Olives and supernaturally annihilates the people that are trying to destroy Israel. It's not a global destruction. It's, a, it's, it's the end of a war that was trying to annihilate the nation of Israel. That's what Armageddon is. The central location geographically for Armageddon is in the Middle East. And the ripple effects of that are going to be the nations that are toing to and throwing over whether they're allies or not with the nation of Israel. So the Jehovah Witness view of Armageddon is so theologically abusive and, and wrong and erroneous. It's incomprehensible to believe that they're even allowed to teach it. I don't know. So going back to Romans 7, which is here. I haven't got my glasses on. Um, what I, for what I will to do, I do not practice. But what I hate, what I believe to be evil, now I'm actually doing it. Now remember Paul said, apart from the law, sin was dead. And this is what I mean when I say some people just shouldn't be involved in religion because they're, you get these compulsive personalities that you can't stop from doing things and they just keep going and going. A lot of these religiously evil people are so that way. Um, so they're doing what they hate. They're doing evil instead of good. If then I do what I will not to do, then it's obvious. He says, I agree with the law that it is good. See, having the intention to not make to, you know, to believe that there's something you can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad is fantastic. That's great. That's good. But it doesn't work. He says, um, for it just blows my mind this because it's so clear. I agree with, with that idea as being good, but now it is no longer I who am doing the stuff that I thought that I needed to do or not do, but sin that dwelling in me. So he's actually transformed himself into this evil person by thinking that there's something he needs to do or not do to make Jehovah happy or stop him from being sad, which is what they're getting taught to do. For I know that in me, that is in my sinful nature, not his body, his sinful nature, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. To do, to make God happy or stop him from being sad is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find because he was disempowering himself to be able to do that by thinking that he could. For the good that I will to do I do not do. But the evil I will not to do. That I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Well, this is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Bye for now.